Coming up, research into a special American animal may also benefit many other species. When we protect the bears and the bear habitat, we're more likely to protect the threatened and endangered and all the other species that share their same habitat. And scientists race to understand an existential threat to a beautiful and mysterious sea creature. Almost everywhere we've looked in the last year, we've seen catastrophic losses of sea stars. Exploring the frontiers of science. Probing cutting edge technologies. Seeking answers to the big questions. Welcome to SciTech Central. There are just eight species of bears in the world, and the North American black bear is more numerous than all others combined. To protect both bears and people, scientists want to understand the travels of these wide-ranging animals. Black bears are an American icon. From popular cartoons to fire prevention campaigns to many national parks, this shy but amiable creature is ubiquitous in our national culture. With a range that includes all but five or six states, the black bear population is large and thriving. That's good news, but it also means there's the potential for increasing numbers of human bear encounters as we continue to encroach on bear's habitat. So it's vitally important that we understand how, where, and why bears move, especially in boundary areas between human space and bear habitat. A group of Central Florida researchers is in the midst of a study that does just that. The main thing that we wanted to explore with the project is the dynamics of bears living in an urban setting. So we wanted to see how that influences their movements, where they go, how frequent they go into neighborhoods or are in the park. The main thing is what are the drivers for these movements? For the cubs, basically looking at the health of the cubs. So you're, you're taking measurements, their weight and length to compare it with historical data on what size the cubs should be at that age. Impetus for the study came from Don Bruyard, an amateur photographer and president of Friends of the Wakaiva River. The idea for the study came from working and doing a lot of wildlife photography in Seminole State Forest. In the first couple years I was out there, I was seeing a lot of bears and it was pretty even densities through a lot of different types of habitats. And then the drought hit in 2010, and all of a sudden I wasn't seeing a lot of bears. But I joined Friends of the Kaiba River at that time and started to get exposed to a lot of people along the, the urban edge. And they were having lots of stories about bears. So I was wondering what the dichotomy was, why we were having this difference in bears. In 2014, Disney Nature awarded the group $25,000, allowing them to move forward with the study. After we were awarded that grant, we continued to obtain additional funding, and now we have grown the study to over an $80,000 bear study in the Wakava Basin, and it's a study that has never been done before in our area. The researchers are placing GPS collars on bears to collect data on their movements. They also rely on volunteers to supplement that data. The volunteers' role is very important because we'll need them to go out and observe and record what they see at the locations that the bears are spending a considerable amount of time so we can understand the bears' choices of where they're going and what habitats they're using. Biologists know that bear behavior is driven mostly by their need to find mates, food, and shelter. So they want to determine the main influences on these decisions and how humans play a role. We've actually moved into their area. It's not the reverse. So we're taking over a lot of the upland oak woodlands that used to be a steady resource for them. That's why we need to be more educated and more aware of our own activities and behavior. And if we do that, we can enjoy the resource of seeing the bears and be safe at the same time. Perhaps most important, by better understanding bears, we can better protect both people and the environment. If we can learn more about the bears and why they're going where they are and how frequently they do that, then we can inform the public on why they're doing it, what behavior we need to change to reduce the number of conflicts that are going on, and to increase safety for those that choose to live near the park. 
happy when we protect the bears and the bear habitat. We're more likely to protect the threatened and endangered and all the other species that share their same habitat. So they are a very important species to the overall ecosystem. Sea turtles have been around since dinosaurs roamed the planet, but with a majority of the world's species endangered, that might not be true much longer. Florida is home to five species, so it's a natural choice for a long-term study. But until UCF scientist Kate Mansfield developed an innovative way to track adolescent turtles, little was known about the early part of their lives. This is a field where there are a lot of data gaps, like where do these animals go, what are they doing? And I'm able to use some neat technologies to figure that out. Traditionally, satellite tags have been too heavy to be able to put on small little turtles that are going to be swimming. Anything that we put on them, we want to make sure that they don't sink. With using solar tags that were actually developed for birds, we were able to minimize the size and the weight of the tags and put them on the turtles, but we had to figure out how to attach the tags so they'd stay on for more than you know, a few days. What we ended up doing is we worked in tanks and we tested a number of different methods. And initially we didn't have very much luck. The shells of the turtles are made of keratin, which is the same thing as our fingernails. So we ended up talking to a manicurist who recommended that we use an acrylic base coat. So these tags, when attached, will stay on for upwards of six months and we can track their long-term movements. These are the very first satellite tracks to examine the long-term movements of these lost year sea turtles. Before we had hypotheses on where they went based on opportunistic sightings and encounters, but with the satellite telemetry, we were able to see where they actually went and we can learn a lot more about their movements and behavior that way. A deadly disease has been killing West Coast starfish for more than a year. The disease has been much less of a problem in Alaska, and scientists hope to find out why. Reporter Katie Campbell has the story. It's early morning in Sitka, Alaska. The stars have yet to fade from the night sky. I'm gonna hand you this bag and then I'll jump off. And a group of scientists is setting out to look for a different kind of star. Sea stars, commonly known as starfish, have been vanishing from Alaska's shoreline. Pete Ramondi is one of the lead scientists studying an alarming epidemic that's been killing starfish by the millions. These cracks from the previous years have been full, guys. You, know, you didn't guys didn't get any last time either, did you? Back in June? This is what? if you found a Pycnopodia. Ramondi and researcher Melissa Miner this have been conducting intensive surveys of Pacific coastal areas, tracking the spread of the disease. Almost everywhere we've looked in the last year, we've seen catastrophic losses of sea stars. Ramondi pounds bolts into rocks so that year after year, they can find and survey the same areas. Once they've roped off a patch of shoreline, the team counts and measures the creatures that live here. Catherine of 40, Catherine of 30. Sitka was one of the first places they noticed signs of the disease last year. Eight leptosterias. I have a mildly sick lepta. Now the team is back to check on the stars. 70, 70. The question is, will starfish in the cool waters of Alaska survive this outbreak? 100. Or will they too succumb? You guys haven't seen many juveniles? No, I haven't seen any. I've got uh, one uh, mildly sick lepto. It's definitely not severely wasted, but those are what we're calling early warning signs of wasting. So this is the beginnings of um, two separate lesions and sometimes what we see is those will grow together and actually um, this, the whole tissue will start to kind of degrade. The symptoms vary depending on the species of starfish, but it usually starts the same way. As they get white lesions, they become necrotic, that means the tissue dies, and as the tissue dies they oftentimes will lose arms and then waste away. We call it wasting away, they disintegrate. Sometimes they get lesions and their internal organs start to kind of spill out of these lesions. And that can happen within 24, 48 hours, so it can be really quick. Starfish deaths were first reported in the summer of 2013 on Washington's Olympic Peninsula. Reports have since surfaced along thousands of miles of North America's Pacific shores. 
sea star wasting syndrome affects almost every species of West Coast starfish. The plague has hit so hard over the last year that biologists fear that some species could even go extinct. Scientists have been scrambling to find answers. So this is a healthy Pycnopodia, no signs of lesions. Drew Harvell is coordinating nationwide research into understanding the wasting syndrome. She's been studying marine diseases for decades. This is the largest disease outbreak that we know of ever in the oceans in terms of the numbers of species affected, in terms of the geographic scale, and in terms of the mortality that's associated with it. After analyzing countless samples in the lab, Harvell's team believes an infectious pathogen, a type of densovirus, may be the root of the problem. This is what we call a wide host range pathogen. It means that it affects many different species, and those are the most dangerous in wildlife disease in terms of a potential risk of extinction. They've learned the syndrome seems to spread through water and through physical contact. And they're testing a hypothesis that the pathogen may be transferred through shellfish, which starfish like to eat. Exactly what triggers these outbreaks is still unknown, but scientists think the disease could be compounded by warming waters. Starfish are stressed by higher temperatures, which make them more vulnerable to infection. Harvell has been keeping an eye on the once abundant starfish populations around Washington's San Juan Islands. Cold waters here may have helped starfish withstand the first wave of the disease. But summertime brought warm waters to the islands, and Harvell and her team watched stars suddenly get sick. I'm expecting that in the next two weeks we will lose virtually all the stars at this site. And that's exactly what happened. All the starfish that were here are now gone. As outbreaks continue in Puget Sound, scientists are looking north for a sign of hope. The hope is that the waters are cold enough in Alaska, the northern part of the range for many of these species, that they'll persist there. This summer, Melissa Miner was hopeful that would be the case. This is one of the few places that um, could potentially be a source of replenishment for some of these areas that have been hit really hard. Back in Sitka, trouble is on the horizon. In recent months, water temperatures here have been higher than normal. A band of warm Pacific water is expected to travel farther north, heating up the waters here even more. To prepare, Ramondi is installing sensors to measure the water temperature. And so we'll get really good records over the next year of temperature, and then we can see whether that relates to any uh, change in the disease that we see uh, at this particular site. And we want to see whether we get a signal of warm water with wasting here. That way, if a mass die-off occurs, they'll know the exact ocean conditions. Piazaster 70. Another Piazaster 70. There's nothing the researchers can do to prevent an outbreak. But they can count and measure what's here now. Their data will provide a critical point of comparison for what normal starfish populations should be. If you don't know what's there, you won't know what's lost. Balanus, rock, rock, balanus. Cathrina, Cathrina. The results of the Alaska intertidal surveys are mixed. So this animal here is probably the worst one that we've seen today. And you can see it's diseased pretty heavily along this arm and then it's also spreading onto this arm. The good thing is that there's not a really high percentage of diseased animals. It's impossible to tell whether the epidemic is nearly finished or whether another mass die-off is just getting started. Not knowing where we are in the chronology of this event is really frustrating and kind of scary. After leaving Sitka, Ramondi and Miner began receiving disturbing reports. The healthy-looking starfish they carefully counted just days before were suddenly losing arms and wasting away. Time will tell whether Alaska will be a starfish graveyard or a refuge. Want to satisfy your scientific curiosity and be on TV at the same time? Send us a video question for our Ask a Scientist feature. Here's an example. 
My name is Kelly. I'm from Orlando, Florida. Um, I know coral reefs are important to the health of the oceans, but I would like to know why. Go to our Facebook page to learn how to submit your video. What happens when you dismantle two hydroelectric dams in the largest dam removal project in U.S. history? The answer might surprise you. Katie Campbell reports from the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. The first time Tom Rorda flew over the Elwha River eight years ago, it was for work. He was taking land survey photos for the Bureau of Reclamation, photos that would be used to help guide the historic removal of two hydroelectric dams. Now he flies over the Elwha for a very different reason. It's my escape. I can leave the office and leave all the pressure of surveying and working and get in the airplane and fly for 20 minutes and just be totally relaxed. Over the last three years, while the dams were slowly dismantled, Rorda had one of the most unique perspectives. He's witnessed profound changes. A giant plume of sand and mud now extends from the mouth of the river. Until I started taking these pictures, no one had any idea how much sediment was coming down, how far it extended out into the strait. So far, about 3 million cubic yards of sediment, enough to fill more than 300,000 dump trucks, has been released from behind the dams. And that's only 16% of what's expected to be delivered downstream in the next five years. All that sediment has already reshaped the mouth of the Elwha, moving it north by about 300 feet and changing its depth by about 50 feet. Just two years ago, this area was covered with smooth stone cobbles. It's since been transformed into long stretches of sandy shoreline. Ready? Ann Schaefer studies the so-called near shore area, where the Elwha's fresh water meets the saltwater tides. She's been eager for sediment to replenish this area. All of the sediment that would otherwise have been delivered from the river was held behind the dams. And so we went into this era of significant sediment starvation. Today, she leads a team of researchers who are trying to find out what creatures are moving into this new habitat. This place is like Christmas. You know, every day you come out here, it's something new. These bags may hold evidence of new life. Back at the lab, the team will sift through the sand, searching for signs that tiny fish are using this area as spawning grounds. Quite lovely. Schaefer is hoping that species like sand lance and surf smelt will start to call this place home. These nearshore fish are a top food source for young salmon, and they're very particular about where they lay their eggs. They have a very fine grain sediment that they require to lay their eggs on. And if you look around, you see that we're now completely surrounded by exactly the, the grain size that sand lamps need to spawn. All this sediment is ideal for building nearshore habitat, but some wonder whether the water is too murky for returning salmon. Sediment can clog and irritate their gills and make it difficult to find food. But Schaefer isn't concerned. Salmon are brilliant. They have evolved over a millennia. So salmon can deal with it. If they're given a chance to acclimate to it, they will. Today, the dams are completely gone. And as sediment continues to travel downstream, Tom Rorda will be there to photograph it. It's fun to watch it. There's still an awful lot of sediment up there. I think it's going to do this for the next five or 10 years. Sometimes animal behavior can seem kind of far out, but if you look closely enough, you can see how all behavior serves a purpose to help an animal mate, eat, avoid predators, and raise young. And since behaviors can come with advantages like these, natural selection acts on them just as it acts on physical traits, ensuring the success of animals who engage in beneficial behaviors while weeding out those that do stupid, dangerous, or otherwise unhelpful stuff. The most beneficial behaviors are those that make an animal better at doing the only two things in the world that matter eating, and sexing. Jane Goodall is the world's foremost expert on chimpanzees. Her research in Tanzania helped redefine the relationship between humans and animals. She recently shared a few stories about her early work and some recent challenges. 
She lit up when she saw this fine fellow, and her warmth for all creatures of the earth is easily felt by all of us hovering around her at the Center for Living Peace in Irvine. Dr. Jane Goodall, the woman who discovered, observed, and shared with all of us the more human side of chimpanzees. But it might not have happened without a mother's love. The authorities wouldn't let this young English girl go out alone into the potentially dangerous forest with potentially dangerous animals. So having finally managed to get the money, Louis Leakey, not me, he got the money for six months, was okay, this American businessman. And then the authorities said no, but Leakey never gave up. So in the end they said yes, but she must have a companion. So it was my mother who volunteered. There was no dragging my mother. She probably didn't love it as much as you, though, I imagine. Well, she loved it in a way, but she, you know, she was particularly thrilled with snakes and spiders and things which could walk into the tent very easily because it was an old-fashioned ex-army tent. No sewn-in ground sheet, nothing like the fancy stuff you go camping with now. You rolled up the flaps to let the air in and you let everything else in too. And I left her on her own with one Tanzanian cook and that was it. Every morning I was up before light. What a good mom. Yeah. Finally able to be in Tanzania did not mean things became any easier. The chimps also challenged her presence. Well, to start off with, they were very scared. They'd never seen a white ape before, and gradually they got used to me, and then they you know, went through a bad time when they tried to drive me away, so I was a predator. And then they kind of gave up on that and came to accept and then trust me. But the relationship we have now is they ignore us. We're just another part of the environment. A few years back, a very personal issue Dr. Jane Goodall deals with came to light. Prosopagnosia, otherwise known as? Face blindness. Face blindness, yes, it's got a scientific name. And interesting, it seems to be hereditary. So it must come from my father, I don't know, and I can't ask him now because my mother recognized all faces instantly. My sister doesn't. And there are certain faces that are easy to recognize and others just fit a certain pattern and till I know the person really well I don't recognize them again it's very embarrassing and um, and as people know they so my, my strategy is to pretend to know everybody <laughs> so I'm always hugging total strangers and then I say oh but you look just like so and so I mean it's, it's a bit silly but it is embarrassing <laughs> but the way you're handling it is ultimately charming <laughs> well <laughs> what else can I do Traveling 300 days a year to share her message with many, many faces, the important question is what can we do? I think the most important thing is for everybody to realize that every single day you make different choices in what you buy, what you eat, what you wear, how you get from A to B, how you interact with people. And if you would think a little bit about the consequences of those choices, has it harmed animals? Did it involve child slave labor? How many food miles is it used? How much pollution was caused? You know, then people start making different choices. And if we care at all about the future of our children, if we don't start doing this en masse very soon, it will be too late. We are the most intellectual being that's ever walked on this planet. So how come we're destroying our only home? It doesn't look very encouraging on Mars, does it, from those pictures of that little robot. So we've only got Mother Earth, and we're destroying her very, very fast. And that's why I work with youth, because we've destroyed their future in, in many ways. So it's up to us now to work with them to try and do as much as we can to restore what we've destroyed. That's all for now on SciTech Central. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for more stories from the frontiers of science and technology.